coming here. This is the uh, final presentation in our series uh, this year uh, related to uh, the e-health agenda in the province of Ontario and uh, across Canada. Uh, we will be having uh, three additional talks related to this in the uh, fall. Uh, so the fall will be a continuation of the e-health uh, uh, government level and institutional level uh, work that's going on across Canada. The, um, starting in January, though, we're shifting our seminar series, and we've been doing planning on this, related to the 50th anniversary of the University of Waterloo. So the theme of the uh, new seminar series beginning in January will be Why Not? And we'll be having some very, very interesting speakers. We and, and a very special day, actually, a conference day that will be uh, built around some of the e-health work that's gone on. So uh, we're looking forward to that in the new year. Uh, this uh, particular seminar is, is uh, part of the Smarter Health series. As you're aware, what we've been doing uh, over the last uh, nine months is talking about uh, e-health in Ontario, uh, e-health with Canada Health InfoWay, and uh, trying to give a picture of the strategies, uh, the tactics, and so on that are being used uh, throughout the country to realize the potential of e-health. Uh, this is brought to, uh, here by the Waterloo Institute for Health Informatics Research and the Infranet Project. Uh, Shirley Fenton, who usually does this introduction far more stately than I do it, is on her way to China uh, in an airplane right now and uh, visiting a number of universities, uh, including Dalian, related to some of our health informatics work and some other uh, work. So uh, we're looking forward to having Shirley see this session uh, uh, the time when she comes back. Our presentation today uh, on the physician and e-health missing link was stimulated by the fact that uh, we have not really heard very much and there hasn't been very much visibility uh, to the whole way in which e-health impacts the physician. Part of the issue has been that in Ontario that has not been an area of great success and that's a kind way of saying uh, that. Uh, in looking to e-health uh, and what's happened and what the potential is, uh, we went actually out of Ontario and uh, a person with whom I know we're trying to think, think this through about how long we've known each other. Uh, we, we figure it's about 1983, but we're not sure which talk. I had a maniacal uh, physician come to a talk and uh, show a system, and I'm pretty sure it was this maniacal system that uh, did it. We, we seem to remember this. He also uh, was part of an early conference back, uh, I think it was 1982 for that conference, uh, that was put on in Winnipeg. So uh, Bill Haver uh, and I have uh, had the chance to be present at many different events. Uh, he's been very, very active in the area of electronic records and physicians practice. Uh, he's actually been involved in system specifications and system development. Uh, having practiced in uh, Saskatchewan in the West, he has a view that's not so much Ontario focused, but focused beyond uh, what, we, what we have uh, succeeded or not succeeded at here. Uh, Bill is the managing partner of Lakeside Medical Clinic in Saskatoon, the former chief of staff of Saskatoon City Hospital, and sits on the Information Technology Committee of the Saskatchewan Medical Association. Uh, he's a medical editor in Healthcare Information Management and Communications Canada, uh, very, very well-spoken, uh, energetic speaker, and I'm very much looking forward uh, to hearing what he has to say today. So, Bill, welcome. Thank you very much, Dominic, and thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, I appreciate the introduction, and I'm going to try to uh, get directly into the meat of the, of the uh, presentation that I've got here today, but I thought I would just quickly give you a, a little bit of information about me. The, I am not actually the missing link, uh, although, and they assured me that when I bought this shirt that the chest hair wouldn't show through either, so I... I uh, am not the missing link myself, but I hope by the end of the day today I will leave you with it. Just maybe just one or two things that you'll be able to take home and say that's probably where the problem is, or that's one of the problems that we now have with including the physician into e-health, whatever e-health is. My clinic, Lakeside Medical Clinic, uh, is the source of most of my knowledge, and what I'm going to be presenting you with today is based on 25 to 30 years of trying to work in this kind of a marketplace. 
I have gathered a lot of information for this little seminar, and I want to acknowledge that most of this has come from other sources. I have uh, I've put together some of the data that you're going to see today, but a lot of the data I have taken from other people's work, and I'll acknowledge that when it comes up on the screen. I do also want you to know that the opinions that you're going to hear are my opinions. I also want you to know that I do sit on the board of directors of Clinicare Corporation, which is a software vendor that sells into the, this particular marketplace, that is the electronic medical records marketplace. So having got that out of the way, what I would like to accomplish today is I'd like to just go over what the original object was when somebody first started talking about e-health in full way. Was there a flaw in that concept? What is the current state of adoption of electronic medical records or the electronic health record in Canada, nationally, provincially, maybe a little bit in other countries? I'll try to flash through that. It's going to be a bit of a blitzkrieg there. And then I'm going to see if we can see a pattern in that, identify how the Canadian players feel like that is, how do the Canadian doctors feel about this whole concept? And then is there a common thread in that? What will it take to succeed? Because we all know right now the concept isn't working very well. The concept hasn't been adopted very well at the physician level. And then we'll draw some conclusions and hopefully have a little bit of discussion. So the original objective, e-health as a concept, was it supposed to originally be the electronic medical record? Was it the electronic patient record, electronic health record? I would like you to have in your mind a breakdown of what these three things are. The electronic medical record is what I use in my office. It's the physician's documentation of their interaction with their patient. The electronic patient record is not a term that's used very much. It's used sporadically across the country, a little bit in the U.S., essentially refers to the hospital's record on a patient. And the electronic health record is that ubiquitous record that they're trying to create on a national scale, both in Canada, the U.S., multiple countries around the world, the European Union in total. Now, what you need to understand is that those bottom two, in my mind, in my opinion, are subsets of the first one. That is, the electronic medical record is the only one that actually represents all of the information on the patient. The electronic patient record is a, a snapshot of one incident of care or maybe a sequence of incidents of care at the hospital, but don't give you any of the underlying background information and don't tie those events together very well at all. And the electronic health record is a very, very long horizontal record that doesn't have a lot of the silos of information within it. It's sort of a cradle to grave subset of what are termed core data elements, which I'm not going to discuss, but you can imagine where that term comes from. Now, it involved developing infrastructure. It involved connectivity and communications. It involved setting standards. And it involves security, confidentiality, privacy, and cost containment. I want you to know, you can take a deep breath, I'm not going to talk about any of those things. I am going to allude to the cost containment factor because one of the questions that I came up with when I was doing this was what was the original objective? I, I wonder, was it to link everything in healthcare to everybody in healthcare? Was the purpose to develop some standards so the doctors, nurses, other providers, hospitals, government agencies, was it to allow them to communicate, to say things the same? Was it to provide better security? Was it to provide some security for patient information to try to protect the doctor-patient relationship? Was it to improve the privacy of the patient or the privacy of health information in an increasingly technological age? Was it to improve healthcare delivery? Was it to, to make the delivery of health care in our society better? Was it to, to improve health care decisions, to improve the quality of care so that we would, as physicians and nurses and other practitioners, would, we would be able to make better decisions? Was it to improve chronic disease management? It's the old 80-20 rule. 80% of our dollars are spent on 20% of our medical problems. 
we could do a lot better in managing some of those chronic diseases? Was it to reduce medical errors? There's a lot of good data out there saying that we're wasting a huge amount of money on just correcting for mistakes we made in delivering the care in the first place. Was it any of those? No, it was none of those. This is my best slide. <laughs> you can go home with that one. It wasn't any of those. The original objective simply was efficiency. Almost all technology in all sectors, in all industries, was introduced with the model of efficiency as the original goal because the computer simply allowed you to do things with less work. It was a means to eliminate repetitive tasks. So you didn't need as many people to do something that simply meant you were doing the same thing over and over again. So it was cost containment. Quality of care, decision support, disease management, all those other things, including the ability to tell whether we were doing a good job or not, all came after. They were all afterthoughts. Was this wrong? I don't think so. I think cost containment is extraordinarily important. I think we need to be honest about that. Healthcare costs consistently increase. They're going up across the country. Every provincial budget continues to increase it. The national costs, as the percentage of gross national product, continue to rise. We are behind on those measures compared to other countries, but it continues to rise worldwide. Those new objectives, those other benefits that I just mentioned, they all have system-wide financial benefits. So there is a dollar and cents component here. There is something that's important on a financial level. The thing you need to understand is that they all originate at the point of care. There is a direct effect on physician behavior. It does have a financial impact, but it's affecting physician behavior. Go home with this little line at the bottom. Intrinsically desirable, inherently complex, practically impossible. I'm describing my wife. <laughs> I'm also describing electronic medical records. They have all of those attributes. And the reason that the adoption rate is so slow is because they're practically impossible. Practically. Now, where is the flaw? Well, desirability and complexity have a cost. Practicality implies cost containment, and impossible means that you've lost cost containment. So consider the concepts of ownership and responsibility into this little formula that we're going to create now. Whose problem is it? Who needs electronic medical records? Who needs the electronic health record? I'm not going to answer the question. I just want you to think about that. Who controls the variables on that? So if the electronic record is needed because the system needs it, because the government needs it, why do they need it? And who controls the variables that govern their access to it? Is it the patient? Is it the doctor? Is it the provider? Is it the hospital? Is it the region? Is it the provincial government? Who can fix that? And is the person who controls the variables the same as the person whose problem it is? Who can fix it? Is that the same as the person who has the problem? Who's going to benefit? Is it the person that had the original problem? Is it the person that controls the variables and the operators that affect that original problem? And most importantly, who's going to pay? Who's going to do that cost containment? Is it either one of those or is it somebody else? It's not a flaw to recognize the value in efficiency, but it is a flaw to fail to appropriate, appropriately attribute the costs to the beneficiaries. And it's also a flaw to fail to recognize who controls the variables because you cannot affect a change if you're not involving the people that control the change that you want to make. And you cannot make the person who is going to do the work 
not receive the benefit. And you cannot make the person who is going to have to do the work pay for the work and not receive a benefit. Really quickly, old stuff, old studies. Originally done in 2003, the Center for Information Technology Leadership did a study in the U.S., survey-based work, on applying an interoperability standards for healthcare information exchange. If they were able to put this in place, what they concluded was that they would have a net saving of $87 billion a year. They would break even in five years. They estimated that the improved patient safety alone, the quality of care, would dwarf the benefits that would re were there because of the redundancy and administrative time saved. So the the quality of care actually would pay for the system even though that cost containment and efficiency that I alluded to before was actually the foundation that they did their numbers on. So the background was that they then went on and looked at provider order entry. That also, that's another subset, but just getting the physicians to do order entry, they were going to save $44 billion per year, $27 billion in medications per year. $10.3 billion in radiology costs, $4.8 billion in lab, $1.9 billion in adverse drug reactions. And I actually think that the, the people that have reanalyzed their numbers have said that the bottom line there, the $1.9 billion, was a gross underestimation. Canada Health Infoway got Booz, Allen, and Hamilton to do the same structured study in Canada. It was the same one that CITL did in the U.S., only they applied it to Canada. They came up with some very, very interesting numbers. They structured it based on a 10-year implementation plan. They found that it would cost $9.9 .9 billion to set this up. But from that, the total cost would, well, the total cost is going to be $22.7 billion over 10 years. That's the upfront cost plus the recurring cost. But over 20 years, it would produce a $48.3 billion saving in reduced adverse drug reaction costs, $3.6 billion in reduced radiology costs, and $10.4 billion in reduced lab costs. The return on investment then is going to be 8 to 1. For every dollar invested, they were going to get $8 back. The net savings over 20 years was $39.8 billion. A positive cash cash flow occurred after year seven, and after year 11, they would be making $6.1 billion per year. So the dollars and cents were there. The dollars, the re if the dollars were the only reason, then they're there. This slide I'm sure you've seen before. It's actually uh, the second group. This is uh, from the New England Journal of Medicine, 2001. It was actually originally done, I believe, back in about 1995, and I am a, I'm a little unclear on that year. But the only reason I show this is that in a group of 1,000 people, 800 of them are going to have symptoms. About 640 people will receive some kind of care. Less than nine of them are actually hospitalized. 24 of them are going to end up in a hospital. But 640 are going to be seen by physicians elsewhere. What that means is, that 80% of healthcare delivery is at the acute care level, the community level, I should say. Virtually all of that clinical information, though, ends up back with their primary caregiver. That is the family physician, the general practitioner, the first person that they saw. Even the information that was in the hospital ends up back with that poor soul who's trying to hold them together. Despite this, almost all of the benefits found in those studies that I just mentioned, the CITL study, the Booz Allen Hamilton one done in Canada, all of the benefits that they showed accrued to the system. It all accrued back to government, hospitals, regions, and provinces. So you can see where I'm going with this. It's not very well masked. Well, this is a quote from the current president of the Canadian Medical Association. Dr. Ruth Collins, I believe it's Nakai. Although the financial benefits are significant, one could argue that the qualitative benefits, particularly in lives saved, create a moral imperative for the initiative. She was speaking about the electronic health record. 
So where do the docs stand outside of our CMA president? Well, CHII and CMA carried out a survey of Canadian physicians just last year and they say it was the most extensive survey of physicians in Canada. Their intention was to just try to find out where physicians were at and help them move into a digital age. They were kind enough to give me their data. I used a very small subset of the information that they gave me. This first one just shows their computer skill levels. The only thing you need to take out of this is that it looks like about 90% of physicians surveyed felt that they had some computer skills, basic or advanced. Very few felt that they weren't proficient at all or didn't use computers at all. So the skill levels are there. Where does that technology get used? Well, in this particular question, the devices that were being used within the practice were mostly the desktops at the office. 90 or 87 percent of the physician survey were using computers in their office. The other, the other items there showed that there were fewer and fewer items being used that were more and more mobile, a trend that nobody expected. They thought that more and more of the usage of these days would be with mobile devices. Much of the technology in general seemed to be divided into physicians that practiced in group or solo practices versus hospital-based practice, whereas those physicians in the groups and solo practices use technology mostly for administrative functions, things like billing, and scheduling, and, and office management. Whereas physicians in hospitals were more likely to use them for clinical reasons, and the ones that they listed in the survey related to status notification, consultant reports, lab diagnostic tests, sending and receiving test orders, and receiving discharge summaries. I didn't particularly like the questions in this particular survey on how they, had, they got to these conclusions, but on an overall scale, I think that this is probably true. This is the way it does break down in our medical groups today. They came up with this map of Canada on the percentage of physicians that use electronic medical records by province. Now, I, I won't, I'm not going to review those numbers because I'm going to tell you that this is CHII and CMA's version of reality. Nobody in this country agrees with it. 26% uh, Alberta, you're going to hear some numbers coming up in a, a bit that are, were given to me from Alberta directly, from the director of their program from the Al Alberta Medical Association. They don't even know where that 26% came from. So I, I'm not sure where it all came from, but this is what the survey produced. So the usages range from uh, a low of 6% in PEI, 12% in Saskatchewan, up to as high as 33% in Newfoundland. Uh, quite a surprise as a result uh, from that particular survey. The EMR was used most often in the office environment, and that's not a big surprise. Less often in the hospital, again, not a big surprise. Hospital physicians were using computers and had more physicians using computers, but they weren't using it for electronic medical records. The business issues facing those practitioners. The only thing I wanted you to see here was the number one ranking on a scale of one to 10 was quality of patient care. So if, they were, if physicians were surveyed asking, what are you looking for in an electronic medical record system, the most important item to them was the quality of care. The actual uh, usage of it, the, the administrative cost of it, and the cost pressures in their practice were ranked farther down in importance in that. The reasons for adopting the EMR Again, the first one, 8.1 on that 10-point scale, was an, a desire for improved quality and efficiency in their practice. And I think the efficiency in this, in this particular slide, the efficiency included both the cost value, the administrative efficiency, as well as the efficiency in the delivery of care. Uh, the way it was worded, it could have been interpreted either way, but I think that, that that's what they meant. They meant both. They went on to rank several other variables here, and I thought some of them were interesting. Just the, uh, the acquiring an EMR from a proven credible vendor, 
or proof that the, the systems are secure, or getting some training on it. And then the training, the installation, and the support were all important factors. And that's something else th that needed to be addressed in the system. If physicians aren't adopting electronic medical records, why aren't they adopting them? What are the barriers? And so this gave me some insight, and we're going to come back to that again in a bit when we look at some other research that was done outside of Canada. The potential barriers, like what was stopping them, again, the number one issue, ranking 7.8 out of that 10 scale, was the time and effort required to implement the EHR. And then at exactly the same level of importance was the high cost to purchase and implement the technology. So time is money, so it boils down to this is a money issue. These people are saying that I just don't have the ability to do this if it's going to take a lot of time. A lot of my time means that I lose income in order to try to put something in that you can't show me has a business case behind it. This was a, a slide that I, I just had to put in because the most important thing that I think you can take from this is that in all settings, at least 66% of the physicians surveyed, which was 1,197 physicians, said that they weren't going to go to computerized medical records. There were no plans to do so. And that's across all of their subsets. So it, that's a very telling number. So what's really happening? Because there is that discrepancy in the numbers out there, there aren't a lot of good studies. The surveys that I found were, were influenced a lot by self-interest. Some of them were vendor-oriented. Some of them were set up in such a way that, that you could see that the answers were predetermined by the questions that were there. There was some very generous interpretation going on based on the needs, the, mostly the marketing needs, of the people putting the studies together. But I was able to gather some information from the different sites across Canada. Some of these were the websites by the medical associations. Some were the sites that the government put up. But the government website in BC says 9% of their doctors used the EMR in 2005. 9% is less than the number that came up in the CMA survey. It was the only province that said it was less than actual, the actual CMA survey came up with. BC is, however, doing some wonderful stuff right now. And there are a lot of physicians involved in a couple of the major projects there. They just signed a, a new contract, and the government has agreed to put in something on the order of $110 million into funding EMR projects. Of that, about $50 million is earmarked for ASP solutions. And I'm not sure if it's limited to only ASP solutions. That's why there's question marks there but it is heavily in favor of application service provider paradigms. $20 million has been earmarked for change management. I, I think they got the ratio wrong there. Uh, it's going to take a lot more than $20 million if they're going to put $100 million into the concept. Change management is going to be their biggest problem. But the regions in BC have started doing things like chronic disease management projects. Some of these management projects are extremely interesting. The way that they have been able to help monitor patients and produce data on the types of monitoring, the effect of applications of clinical practice guidelines, the effect of trying to apply certain protocols, seeing if they can alter the, the outcomes on the care of these people. The one in uh, BC is a uh, uh, congestive heart failure one. They also have one on diabetes there as well. They also have a very interesting project going on on Vancouver Island through VHA, the Vancouver Island Health Authority, on the electronic medical summary. A very interesting method of exchanging information on a patient. I was just talking to Dominic earlier and we were trying to uh, identify some of the reasons for the slow uptake of electronic health records in Canada and, and if, if they're waiting for a killer app uh, within healthcare for the doctors to be spurred on so that they'll buy into this, there, there's probably never going to be a particular application that's going to make a difference. But this type of thing, the electronic medical summary, is one of those that will help accelerate buy-in. 
because it's a method of allowing communication between doctors. It's a method of allowing for a thread of information to be maintained until the care of that particular patient has been taken care of. And it's com completely platform independent. Doesn't matter what kind of electronic medical record system you use. Doesn't matter what kind of communications you use. It can, uh, it can maintain that thread and allow for a continuity of information across the care of that particular problem. In Alberta, I'm going to spend a little bit of extra time on Alberta because they are clearly the leaders in Canada and maybe in the world, with some exceptions of in Europe, on introducing this to the physician community. It was a joint initiative. The POSP program, that stands for the Physician Office System Program, was a joint initiative with the Alberta Medical Association and the government there. It started back in 2001. It was a grant system totaling up to about $7,000 per year per doctor. As of March of this year, they had 3,369 physicians. That's 61% of the Alberta doctors. The other numbers, if you remember the map, the other numbers said 26%. I spoke to Mary Gibson. Mary Gibson is the, the individual in charge of this particular program. And she's adamant that these numbers are exactly accurate. They were up to date. She went out and she even got the latest numbers that day that I was speaking to her on the telephone. That's a much bigger number than 26%. The Alberta program will fund these positions for up to 48 months. They have various levels of involvement, but even those levels break down to most of the physicians using it at the highest level of involvement. Level two means that they are documenting patient encounters on electronic record. They maintain a problem list on the electronic record. They maintain a medication list on the electronic record. So to achieve level two funding, they have to be doing certain things. They have to achieve certain outcomes. I'm going to come back to that in a second. But it's interesting to note that 844 of those 2,784 physicians haven't even selected a vendor yet. So, and I'm thinking this is where some of the discrepancies are coming in. My problem in understanding these numbers as I was going through this was that this isn't adding up. The POSP program is giving me these numbers when the physicians have got in, are getting the funding, but haven't even selected a vendor, don't even have a computer in their office yet. And that was it's one of the problems that we have in understanding just how well this is being adopted. These physicians have committed to it and are getting the funding, but haven't actually done the job yet. So far, they've got 93% retention rate in Alberta. Nobody's dropping out of that. And 85% of the physicians are using the technology. 85% of the ones that have bought and bought into the system. They have instituted an evaluation program there. The evaluation program is used, uh, is put in place by the AMA, and it's actually teams of people, including a physician, going out and seeing if these physicians that are receiving funding are, in fact, using the system the way they're supposed to use it in order to achieve that funding. And those numbers that you can see there for yourself are pretty good. 100% of the physician's offices are using it for scheduling, but the most important one, 71% of them are using it to chart clinical information. And I think that was the goal, to try to get that particular value up. The program is very popular with the physicians there, and it does not appear to just be a monetary popularity. The physicians are able to see that they're producing some results and are able to see that the outcomes are, are improving, that they are achieving the goals that we're set by the, uh, by the program. In Saskatchewan, where I'm from, I unfortunately don't have a lot to report. Saskatchewan does have the Health Information Solutions Center, formerly Saskatchewan uh, Health Information Network. They do have the Pharmacy Information Program. The PIP program in Saskatchewan is based on the infrastructure that was put together in Alberta for the PIN program. PIN stands for Pharmacy Information Network. PIP is Pharmacy Information Program. Essentially the same infrastructure. The advantage that Saskatchewan has over any other province in implementing this is Saskatchewan's pharmacy network already has a database underneath this. 
we already can populate all the fields in this particular program so that if a physician has a patient come into his office and they want to prescribe something, they will be able to see that this patient has received the same prescription from any number of other physicians, the timing of those prescriptions, and whether there have been any interactions or other problems, whether they're shopping around for different doctors or whether they're shopping for other medications. So it has potential to be very successful in Saskatchewan, more so than in other provinces that don't have that underlying database. Saskatchewan also is introducing some laboratory systems integration and all of the regional health authorities in Saskatchewan are adopting a single uh, laboratory system, laboratory information system, which they're hoping to tie together on a provincial-wide basis. There is no incentive programs for physician adoption. Despite that, 13% of the physicians in Saskatchewan use a full-time EMR anyway. There was a proposal made by the Saskatchewan Information Technology Committee, a committee of the FMA, uh, on putting in place an incentive program for physicians. It was based on outcomes and it was based on utilization. There was a baseline grant to physicians for a limited period of time, but then it was an evergreen program that would pay the physicians for doing certain things with the computer. It was a very good plan. The government approved it. The government said, go ahead with it. But unfortunately, they said, you have to use the money that you already have. And the SMA said, no, it has to be new money. And as usual, the government won and nothing happened. This is the survey that was just done in May of this year uh, in Saskatchewan. I can just run through that, but it shows that right now uh, the majority of uh, Saskatchewan physicians that at least responded to this survey do not use electronic records. 82%, 13% are. When they asked if no, like if you're not using EMR, uh, does the electronic, me or, I'm sorry, <laughs> if you are considering uh, the electronic record, and the, of the members that indicate the practice does not use EMRs, one-third say that they are considering adopting EMR. Now, if they don't adopt the EMR, why not? It's unbelievable that 41% of the physicians in that province say they prefer paper records. We have a, a mountain to climb here. The financial investment required was the second biggest barrier. 33% of them said they wouldn't spend the money that was required. And the other reasons just go down from there. This is a very current survey. This survey is only a couple of months old now. So you can see that even though it's 2006 and EMR is recognized as a standard, it's not being recognized within the physician community. Rating the readiness, the important thing to see here is that physicians weren't ready. Even though the person who wrote up this slide said that it looks like 58% are at least somewhat ready, I interpret it to show that there's at least 36% that really don't give a damn and aren't going to do it. They're not ready to do it and have shown no interest in doing it. Here in Ontario, you're already familiar with Ontario. I won't bore you with the things that are happening here that you already know about. But Ontario is very interesting for the physicians in the rest of Canada. We have a little bit of trouble figuring out what's happening here because it keeps changing. And the, the changes aren't always as easily understood as you might think they are for us outsiders. Currently what you have, to the best of my abilities, you have the OntarioMD.ca, which is a subsidiary of the OMA, which is essentially just a portal. It provides access for various other services, but it's a portal. Then we have Smart Systems for Health, which provides doctors with a secure internet connection, a network that they can connect to other doctors in the province. They have clinical management systems. These are just approved vendors, more or less, that they can meet certain security, technology, and functionality standards, very similar to the V-Cure process, the vendor conformance and usability requirements put together in Alberta that it's the clinical management systems here. They have a transition support program that's to help physicians acquire and use information technology. And they have the primary care IT funding plan all here in Ontario. Now, 
These are the groups that are eligible for that funding. I think that I'm going to have a fit if my fig hits the fan. It's, I, I, have been, I can't figure out all this. I have an opinion on it, which I'll get to a little bit later. But uh, this, is, this is a guaranteed way to have your proposal fail. Anytime that you make something so complex that you have to identify who's going to qualify based on some other set of criteria and those criteria keep changing, you're doomed to failure. The other way you're going to be doomed to failure is if you tie your incentive program to some form of alternative payment. I'll come back to that again. Now, I got some information right from the horse's mouth. Uh, the, the Ontario MD Incorporated is currently managing the PCIT program, and the information I got there is that it is a $28,600 per physician subsidy. The comprehensive package includes a one-time readiness grant, $4,500, a monthly subsidy of $600 per physician for 36 months, a one-time performance recognition payment of $2,500 per physician, and then participating physicians within an eligible group must choose the same CMS product because the money is actually paid to the group. Apparently, since April of 2005, they've funded 90-plus group practices. That boils down to about 2%, 2.6% of the Ontario MDs. That's a commitment of about $20 million over the next three-year period, which is actually a small portion of the total funding that they have and a very small portion of the number of doctors in the province. There is a national initiative, Canada Health InfoWay. I, again, am not going to go into a lot of detail here, but this is an arm's length federal corporation. They have a huge amount of money, and they are doling it out uh, with public sector partnerships. They want to support, the, the, this is their statement, supporting a safer, more efficient health care system it's a not-for-profit organization. It's made up of Canada's 14 federal, provincial, and territorial deputy ministers of health. The, the InfoWay projects that are out there do not provide any direct incentives to physicians. There may be some physician involvement in various projects, but there is no money going directly to physicians to encourage the use or adoption of electronic medical records. This is a slide taken right from their, uh, their brochures and their own slideshows. But the goal, if you read at the bottom, is that they plan to have an interoperable electronic health record in place across 50% of Canada by the end of 2009. The average adoption rate among physicians in Canada right now is still something under 8%. So we've got a long ways to go. It is 2006. They, in that slide deck that they sent me, this was one of the slides. They say that the status quo methods of engaging end users will not enable the goal. It's time to move to the next level. By investing in end user acceptance, InfoWay will take substantial steps with jurisdictions to master the acceptance challenge to increase pan-Canadian ability to remove the barriers to end-user acceptance and to transform end-user acceptance into a primary enabler of implementation and value realization for the electronic health record solutions. That's a very noble statement. I don't think that they've made any steps to do that. There has been no initiative that I'm aware of through InfoWay that would actually alter the method of, of promoting electronic medical records to physicians. Quickly, what's happening in the rest of Canada? What's going on elsewhere? Is there anything going on in the U.S.? Is there anything going on in other countries? Dr. Dennis Prady at the University of Victoria did a, an analysis of 10 countries and just presented it at uh, the eHealth conference in Victoria. Uh, May, May, in May. And uh, again, I was lucky enough to get some of that information there. The U.S. information I gathered partly out of the University of Minnesota, their Center for Research and the School of Public Health. 
U.S. was always behind Canada in the adoption rate, but since they have instituted uh, an incentive program there, their adoption rate has accelerated to the point that they now have 11.5% of their physicians are f fully implemented an electronic medical record system. Further, 12.7% have some form of implementation in progress. 14.2% say that they're going to be implemented within the next 12 months, and 19.8% will have implementation within 24 months. That means that over 50% of all physicians in the U.S. are going to have some form of electronic medical record within the next two years, according to this particular research group. That will be something amazing to behold if that can happen. That would be the fastest adoption rate that I've ever heard of. What they went on, when in, as part of their study, they went on to try to find out what were the barriers to that adoption. And the primary barrier was once again cost. So they tried to quantify that cost. The cost among the adopters, it cost $32,606 per physician to buy into an electronic medical record system. That was the average cost. And then there was the average maintenance cost ended up being $1,177 per month per physician forever to keep that system there. Those are just maintenance numbers. So you can imagine that that's a, a prohibitive added cost to something that they could not show had any financial benefit. When they did the study, they're, they're looking for the reasons for why is adoption so slow in the U.S. The original reasons when they first did this, they were looking at uh, the expert systems or clinical decision support systems, and nobody wanted them. Why didn't they want them? It boiled down to a quote I got somewhere that said, if I am being regimented, I am being regimented if you give algorithms to me but I am being systematic if I develop algorithms for myself. They didn't want to be dictated to by the system. The recognition that an EMR could improve healthcare quality, reduce medical errors, reduce healthcare costs was still not sufficient motivation to overcome resistance to the EMR adoption. Without a strong physician demand, hospital and practice administrators did not see sufficient potential return to try to overcome this resistance. This was in a study on uh, JAMIA in 2005 by Berner and all, and it was a very interesting read. And they noted that the only problem that was consistent across all the jurisdictions that they set was they, if they didn't get physician buy-in, the whole project failed. In 2004, David Brailer was appointed the National Health Information Technology Coordinator, and his comment at that time was that all Americans will have an EHR within 10 years. Well, if the current adoption rate in that study holds up true, then maybe they'll make it. But the reality seems to be a lot different from the numbers that are being projected there. And I don't see that adoption rate. There was a, 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 the NHII conference in 2003. The conclusions from that conference, the closing address, so that they're stated that the government must become part of the solution in terms of financial incentives for EHR adoption. Because although the physician has to change his or her practice and make investment in EMR systems, most of the benefits go to the organization, the payers, or even the patient and very little goes to the physician. This is Prati's work, and I'm just going to flip these numbers up to show you something. This first slide deals with the percentage of GPs with office computers. The low number there is Germany at 90%. That's the low number. Compare that to Canada. Remember I said averaging 8%? somewhere between 6 and 10% in Canada. 90% is the low number out of these 10 countries that he surveyed. Uh, I'm just, I'm hoping that I'm not locked up here. There we go. <laughs> now the percent who, in a paper light office, 
that is still using some paper, but the majority of the information is on the computer. Those are the same 10 countries then. And you can see that Norway and Denmark are leading the way. When they talked about uh, automated medication prescriptions, this is the, where the physician constructs the prescription on the computer system and there's some form of testing of the prescription that's taking place on site in that system, looking for drug to drug interactions, drug to disease, drug to allergy, that type of thing. Uh, the automated medication prescription is very high in almost all the countries. Norway at 100%. But you can see that this is one of those enabling applications that I was referring to. The messaging system in BC here in Canada is one of those enabling applications. The prescription writing programs that are out there that do the drug to drug checks to reduce the error rate is an enabling application that becomes very important to the physician. It's a, a physician driven initiative because physicians are interested in the quality of care. You saw that in a previous slide as well. The data exchange that, that EMS project in BC that I referred to, again, proved to be a big deal in some of the countries. Those countries that used it, and the most notable one here was actually Denmark, has the most complex and the most complete system of exchanging information between physicians. They actually put a portal in place and they put a standardized vocabulary in place to allow for the transfer of information between physicians that was brief, concise, and medically accurate. And it became one of the things that accelerated adoptions in that country. Those countries that don't have that still had fairly high adoption rates, but they had them for other reasons. Lab results were also a very important component in this. Those countries and those physicians that could receive lab results electronically have shown an accelerated adoption. This is another enabling application. In my own experience, in my own office, we are now 16 doctors. We have 110,000 patients on file. We're an extraordinarily busy clinic. We see approximately 600 patient encounters a day. We see more patients in my medical office than all three academic hospitals in the city combined. We're very busy. The thing that made the difference for us wasn't just our interest in quality of care, but the benefits that we gained in laboratory and the, and the EDI system, electronic data interchange with the laboratory, proved to be a good business choice. It allowed us to, to be more efficient in our practice as well as provide better quality of care. And there's less redundancy to the system because the lab information is right there. Exactly the same argument can be made for the prescription writing program. And the benefit accrues on the quality side as well because there's less errors involved. Our prescription writing program is checking for things just like our laboratory data is there and highlights those things that fall out of the norm or that may be significant relative to that patient's particular problem. So this was a big adopter, a, a big accelerator for those countries that were surveyed by Prodi. Did they get government funding? Well, obviously no trend there. Well, five out of five did, five out of five didn't. Did they have the vendors accredited? Well, some of them did, some of them didn't. However, it was believed that the accredited systems were better and more useful, that there was some value to be gained. There were some downsides in that some good companies fell by the wayside that didn't make accreditation, but the overall the system benefited by having a vendor accreditation system in place. The government did pay a part in most of these countries. It didn't always relate directly to what they did to the doctors or for the doctors, but what they did by setting up infrastructure and setting up systems that the doctors could uh, benefit from. They could achieve some, some goals of their own by utilizing a government initiative. 
And then closely related were the financial incentives and rewards that were provided to GPs if they automated. That didn't exist in all countries, but it was there in some. Where it was, the GP adoption was much higher, much faster. Uh, this unifying organization, I, I bring this slide in from uh, Parati's work mostly because the lack of a unifying organization was a significant limiting factor in a number of countries. It didn't seem to matter whether the, the unifying organization was government funded or not, it mattered whether it existed or not. The New Zealand example, which is a, you should, you should really read about what's going on in New Zealand, uh, but their unifying organization was a, just another company that was outside of government and helped to tie all the docs together and promote the use of electronic medical records. The other important ones was just the non-financial support of GPs, just providing them education, providing them some support people, providing them access to, to uh, uh, knowledgeable people that could help them get through that change management, the cultural changes that are incurred. Certification of vendors, the use of communication standards, nomenclatures, it was all impossible without the participation of the general practitioners. That was, that was actually the conclusion that they had, that Prati had in his work. This is my own study. This is the Bill Haver Survey of Canada, done through the auspices of my basement office. I surveyed anybody that I knew, anybody that would answer my email. A highly selective scientific study. I'm sure it would pass the rigors of any institution. These were all champions, that is, and I mean that seriously, these are people that know what they're doing. These are people that are either educators or primary movers within their own jurisdiction that are the decision makers. And they responded, most of them supplying me with the slides that you've seen. And they gave me a lot of information. But this is what it boiled down to. Overall physicians in Canada feeling marginalized because of a lack of consultation. They don't feel like they've been involved from the beginning Therefore, they feel like the system is having something foisted upon them. They feel like there's still a lack of respect for physicians. There's still a persistent misconception that the physician is motivated only by greed. They forget to step back and look at the business principles in that although we work in a socialized medical system, we in fact are operating within that system as an independent business. We can't continue to just throw money out that is in fact our only source of income to provide a benefit for the government who feels that it's, it's a, to their advantage. Coming back to tying incentives to alternate payment schemes, there is no evidence that I could find in any study that fee-for-service systems were the problem. And there was a lot of evidence, and Ontario provides most of it, that tying an alternate payment schedule to some form of incentive towards computerized technology, towards electronic medical records, is a definite deterrent. Benefits of involvement in EHR would far outweigh any cost containment that you're going to achieve in an alternate payment plan. And the productivity that you get from the alternative payment plans drops on a per physician, per service, per physician basis. You actually cannot get a better bang from your buck than you can get in a fee-for-service environment. Concerns identified by the physicians included cost factors, but they, they, in, they clump dollars together with human factors. It's not just the purchase, support, training, and evergreening, it's the change management. Change management is the biggest concern they had in the non-monetary area because it affects the way they practice medicine. It affects their interaction with their patients. They didn't like the market confusion. There's two, there was no clear physician-centric objective appraisals of the vendors. There was nobody out there saying that these vendors are doing a good job, these vendors aren't good. And a lot of the physicians aren't computer experts. They don't know what they're buying. They don't know what a good system is. And they don't have the time to research it. They would love to have somebody out there saying, okay, these vendors are doing a good job, these vendors aren't. You don't have to eliminate anybody, but you could have some sort of objective appraisal. 
This, is, this next point gets me into a lot of trouble. There's no truly unbiased physician advocate in Canada. There isn't. There is, uh, many small vendors have questionable stability. There's a lot of questionable support abilities amongst the vendors, but we don't have an advocate for the physician in, in this area, in the area of healthcare informatics. There is a very complex political scheme in for way the projects, the different provincial initiatives, the very confusing numbers that I've already uh, shown you, the turf protection that goes on in different jurisdictions, the, the inability to get an interface because your hospital won't agree to communicate with you because you also deal with another lab down the street. It's, it's very, very obscene. Uh, there is a lack of a well-articulated business case for the frontline providers. There's a failure of the system to recognize where the benefits accrue. And there is no meritocracy. There isn't a reward for being excellent in what you do. We reward volume or we limit them based on salaries. We don't incent them to use the electronic medical record to actually be better at what they're trained to do. There's no unifying force that can effectively and consistently influence the provinces. And we're frozen by indecision. That's what the doctors feel. I call it the viewer effect because every time a province introduces a new perk that they call electronic medical records, they first introduce it as a viewer. What a waste of time. I'll, if you want to talk about that later, we'll talk about it later, but I disagree with that. The, uh, the lack of integration with other providers, we've talked about that a bit. Security and privacy concerns, that's an old issue, but it still exists. There's a fear of the learning curve. It's a fairly steep learning curve. They don't have time to learn. There's the effect on workflow. Again, this is change management because it affects not just their practice, their mode of practice, but it affects their office culture. And the office culture is extraordinarily important. Because although you may be the physician, if Mary, the secretary, doesn't like the system, you're hamstrung. It does affect their income. The swamp theory on time is my own theory. And the bottom line is that it's difficult to remember that your original intention was to drain the swamp when you're up to your ass in alligators. So it's hard to get somebody to buy into a system that they have to spend time and money learning when they're so busy seeing patients because there's not enough doctors and there's too many patients. Quickly, the conclusions to wrap it up, there is going to be a tremendous benefit in electronic health records. I have no doubt in my mind. But there will be no effective electronic health record until physicians are involved. Physician adoption has been slow, but it's growing, and it's growing faster where there are incentives. Meaningful physician involvement in the process is required but there needs to be an ethical market environment and that must be enforced. Infoway, Infoway can be that tying force. It could bring everybody together. If it presents itself as a cohesive force, if it involves physicians, if it removes political bias, if it removes conflict of interest, if it sets itself up as a single standards agency and does conformance testing on the systems. Adoption is going to accelerate if there's a focus on patient care issues at the primary care interface. It has to provide evergreen funding based on both utilization of the records and on outcomes achieved by utilizing the electronic record. You, you should have to, or we need to start to reward dedication, quality, and excellence and not penalize any initiatives, commitment, or hard work Change management has to be provided direct financial support with no strings attached. Thanks, and I'm sorry I ran over Dominic. So here's where we have a chance to uh, talk with you and ask questions, and uh, I want to open it up. If you just give me a minute to get the microphone uh, to you, I'd appreciate it. Also, I want to point out that there is a uh, quite a number of people who come into this session by webcast, and if there are any questions from the people in the webcast audience, uh, please chat those back to us, and we'll ask the, uh, one of the people will ask the question here. So questions or comments from anyone?
Um, I was just wondering um, a few things, I guess. <laughs> the first, <laughs> I'll, just start, I'll just start with one. Um, one thing, and I, I just had a recent experience working with the surgeon community here in Kitchener and Waterloo, um, but one thing that I'm wondering about from your perspective is that you're all, and you alluded to this, that you're small business operators. Now, other small business operators, um, I guess, invest without, invest in technology without um, financial incentives and all of this just because that's the cost of doing business to mm -hmm. secure demand for their services, to create an efficient operation, all that sort of thing. How come that doesn't translate over into the physician world that, you know, as the cost, like this is the way, you know, um, the internet is here. Mm -hmm. How can we leverage that? Um, and there seems to be even that type of issue. I, and going back to saying, um, I forget what the number was about uh, how they're just not interested or don't even, uh, they prefer paper. Mm -hmm. How long can that type of attitude uh, persist in this, in this day and age? Well, I, I don't know how long it can persist. Uh, the paper environment can persist as long as the physicians want it to because those physicians on an individual basis are still doing a good job for their patients. The, the question you had originally with why doesn't it translate from the business world to the medical or the clinical world, partly because there are too many other parameters involved. It's Although we operate it as a business, none of those benefits that we would get that are there necessarily accrue directly. Isn't as willing to spend the money on a cost of doing business basis, like as you mentioned, as they would be to do something that they could see a direct business advantage from. Now, having said that, there are obviously a lot of physicians across this country that have already done this. Uh, and I should only speak for myself, but my in electronic is we haven't received a single grant. We haven't received a single penny from anybody. The government didn't give us any particular dispensation on anything. We paid for our system. We have paid to evergreen our system. We feel that there's a benefit there. We feel we're doing a better job. We did quantify it. We put the numbers down on paper and were able to attract new physicians to our group based on the business case of using electronic health records. Unfortunately, I have learned over the last 20 some years that not all physicians are willing to do that for all of those reasons that I already put up. It has to do with the cultural change. It has to do with, with their, their time commitments, their commitments to medicine, everything from their fear of, of somehow breaching that patient doctor confidentiality to their fear of loss of information, even right down to their fear of, of making a mistake, uh, just not looking smart. Uh, there's a lot of different levels of fears in there. But the number one fear, the number one thing that came up in all of the questions that we asked was just the cost and time. Cost too much takes too much time. The question that she asked was, how, how did my office get to that point? Uh, we, we were given an opportunity to, to try to introduce the technology through the interest of one person. That was me. And it was, you, you heard Dominic mention the word champion earlier, and I think that that's something that we've sort of lost sight of. Any single location, I don't think it would apply to a jurisdiction, certainly not as big as a province, but a small point of care, a solo office, a small group, a larger clinic, but not much beyond that, can be driven by a single individual. In my case, I had an interest in doing this. I was willing to champion it. I was willing to put in the extra hours. I was willing to learn how to be a, a geek. And I didn't become a very good geek, but I learned how to dial 1-800 and get help, and that's what got me through it. So I, I think if, this, if there was any one thing that was different for the early adopters is that they were, in fact, early adopters, 
and that was because of a personal interest, and they were willing to champion it. Now we don't have as many early adopters left, and we don't have any champions, at least in the individual groups now. Any other questions? One question, I'll get, uh, get handed back here. Uh, one question I'd like to ask you, could you pass that back to me? Is, uh, we're aware from recent literature that uh, protocol uh, management is failing. Now that was introduced as a concept in order to improve patient safety and, uh, and so on. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? First of all, do you use uh, protocols within your practice, clinical protocols? And what do you see as the issue there from the physician side? Protocol-driven medicine is uh, it, certainly, from a scientific viewpoint, does have some benefits. You're able to, to follow what has been uh, evaluated, different, different forms of care, different methods of care, different uh, sequences of care, different forms of intervention have been analyzed in a, uh, a scientific fashion, a clinical fashion, put together in a way that have shown good outcomes. The problem is that it, it dictates to the physician exactly how things have to be done. That, that whole approach in, in a physician environment doesn't work. The dictation doesn't allow for variabilities based on individual disease, individual personalities. I, I, I often get into a little bit of trouble when I try to explain to people that there is a lot of art that goes into medicine. And the art of medicine is knowing, in a lot of cases, it's knowing what's going to work with one individual, what will work better than something else, even if it's not part of a protocol. And having the ability to alter what you're going to do to better suit that particular patient. If you follow protocols exactly, you will always find an exception. You almost always have to break away from the protocol. In those cases, you have to, you can get good results. The computer system, any computer system that I'm aware of that forced you to follow a protocol, even if the protocol was simply documentation of the information, failed because the physician has to have that ability to put in some of the nuances that are important to just that particular physician or that particular patient. So I, I have no problem with protocol-driven medicine. I think actually it's a good idea. It's shown us ways that we can streamline care. We've, it's shown us when something is important or not important, when it's cost-effective or not cost-effective. But we need to always maintain the ability to break out of that protocol to do something else that may be more, more intelligent for that particular case. Um, okay, it's, I've got actually two questions. The first sure. one is, uh, you said that in the States they have a higher adoption rate of EHR than in Canada. Mm -hmm. um, in Canada we've got socialized medicine, there's a single payer, there's one person with a strong incentive. The States doesn't have that. Why do they have higher adoption than we do? Who's pushing it? They, I, I'm not sure if there's a single reason that I can give you for the higher adoption rate. They didn't have a higher adoption rate. If I, if I think I would have done this same survey, uh, five or ten years ago, we would have had a higher adoption rate than the U.S. But they have had some government incentives over the last few years. The Bush administration has put some money in place. But also, as importantly, what you alluded to in your question about the complex payor system, it, it, it involves things like uh, insurance companies, insurance schemes, and HMOs that are now requiring the substantiation for your payment. So you have to provide clinical information to justify what you're billing for. So you have to provide essentially an outcome to say, this is why I'm going to bill for this. This is why I deserve to get paid for this. To do that in a paper environment is ridiculous. Very, very time consuming. Your overhead costs skyrocket because it takes so many support personnel to be able to just do that to justify what you're billing. In a computerized system, it's, it's a no-brainer, you know. You do it, it's recorded, and it says, okay, if I build this code, I have to send along this, 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 and this along with that, and it's gone. So that's their big incentive. Is, um, there, you have a lot of figures for the sorts of savings that EHR could provide. Mm -hmm. If one person adopts EHR, one office, 
does that provide those benefits to all their patients, or do you have to have wider adoption before those benefits start to be seen? Those numbers that I put up there were national numbers. Uh, it, it loses all validity as you bring it down to one patient or even one provider. As you heard me say to an earlier question, I was able to show a business case on a single clinic, and at that time, that single clinic was only four doctors. And at that time, the literature said it wasn't cost effective for less than six doctors. The only reason I did the, the survey of our own operation was to show that it was valid even at four doctors. But at four doctors, that was the break-even point. I could not show it as a benefit for one patient. I would, you know, I, it would be an anecdotal type of thing. Uh, I have some patients that would argue that. Uh, just over lunch today was telling Dominic about the criticism I received from my wife for sitting on the beach in Maui doing some care updates on a patient of mine who had breast cancer. That electronic medical record made a difference to her because I was there and she knew I was there. I was 5,000 miles away, but I was there. So on that basis, it makes a huge difference, but that, that's not a monetary explanation. That's a quality of care and a very, very personal, very, very personal type of interaction that a doctor has with his patients. I've also mentioned to somebody else in another private discussion that when we talk about doctors, all doctors are jerks, except my doctor, who is a, a saint. And we all feel that way. So as a group, we're all jerks, but on an individual basis, every single one of them is a saint. I right, go figure. Yeah. Uh, just a couple of points. Uh, I believe has uh, brought forward an adoption funding strategy, and that's being executed uh, in Ontario as well. I think they're getting some matching funds. I'm not positive that, but I know Ontario has recently put up, a, I think it's $20 million, but I'm not sure, related to adoption strategies, not in the electronic medical mm -hmm. record area, but other areas. Uh, the incentive program you listed is the only one I'm aware of for doctor's office. And the other one is, by the way, that Brailler uh, two weeks ago, I think, resigned. Yes, he did. So we have a, uh, the United States is a, in, in a, uh, a period of shift. What I wanted to ask you about is uh, you now have, US, I think you said 112,000 patients? 110, yeah. Do you ever do any kind of uh, data mining kind of research or clinical research uh, on that population of patients? Have you had an experience with that? Any thoughts on it? We, uh, yeah. It, it is something that all physicians are interested in doing. We do it in our office on a very personal basis. Uh, uh, data mining is, uh, is not a good term. Uh, we prefer not to use that because it sounds like a fishing trip. Uh, but instead, we try to do specific research projects within our patient population. And yes, we have done several. When a drug gets pulled, for instance, uh, uh, the, the most recent one I can think of right now is Biox. When Biox got pulled from the market, it's easy for us to survey our patients, find out who's on Biox, and call them up or send them a letter and tell them to get off of it. But we also do things like, like research uh, to see if we're doing appropriate medicine. Uh, have we done mammograms on all women over the age of 50 uh, at least once every two years, and can we survey that? Do we do pap smears on women uh, in the appropriate age group at the appropriate frequency? So that sort of in-house research just to help to manage our own quality of care, we certainly can do that and do do, do it. We've also contributed to uh, a couple of larger research projects through the university uh, and that got us into some trouble and it's kind of given us cold feet on it because even if something has ethics approval through the ethics board of the university, the patients really don't give a damn. If they get a phone call from somebody that they haven't heard of, don't know who they are, and that person says, uh, how come you didn't follow up on that abnormal pap smear? They think it's a violation of their privacy. And, and we actually got called up on the carpet for doing that, even though we had all the right papers. So we do it in-house now. We don't do it out-of-house, and the only contacts that the patients ever get are from myself or from my staff that the patient recognizes. So the question from the web? Yeah. Uh, in your opinion, what would be a good incentive uh, to doctors to adopt EMRs? What would be a good incentive? Uh, 
I think that my particular preference for a plan doesn't exist anywhere in Canada, and it's open to criticism, but I'll give it to you anyway because you asked the question. My preference is that it's uh, a fee that is added to any patient encounter. It's essentially a premium put on any fee that's charged by the physician as they would in any jurisdiction in Canada. It has a flaw in that the argument against that is what about the physicians who by the nature of their practice do low volume medicine or are salary based. I have no problem with either of those groups if they're counselors and see a lower, uh, a, a lower number of patients then I think there has to be a baseline uh, grant given to them over a limited period of time to allow them to do that initial outlay to be able to buy the system. After that point in time, any premium put on the fee would certainly cover the evergreening costs. The fee provided to all the other doctors would also be just that required to do the evergreening because these systems all become obsolete over time. It is a cost of doing business, as you heard earlier, so that would remove the cost from the physician, simply make it a flow-through fund from the payers so that they could reap the benefits. The second part of that incentive plan would also mean that they would have to contribute to some form of outcomes. And I don't think any physicians are averse to that as long as it doesn't contravene the basic privacy and confidentiality legislation and doesn't contravene the doctor-patient relationship. Second question? Uh, yeah, no, there are a couple of questions from someone else, actually. Okay. <laughs> Well, you're the question man. <laughs> <laughs> so many uh, first of all, thanking you for the presentation. Um, it, it's excellent. Uh, one factor required to motivate change is dissatisfaction with your present state. Have you experienced or found that dissatisfaction with paper happens more often in group practices, thus motivating groups to EMR but leaving the majority of FPs failing practitioners? Uh, so the duo and motivated to change. Uh, there's a lot of dissatisfaction with paper. Uh, Paper records are lost. Paper records are forever misfiled. Paper records fall apart. Paper records take up a lot of space. Space is real estate. Real estate is expensive. It, it's a business case against paper. But also, paper is hard to do any kind of qualitative research on. When you're treating a patient, when you're trying to manage chronic illness, it's extremely difficult to, to easily peruse a chart and gather information on that particular kind of a problem. So there's a lot of frustration with paper out there. Why that doesn't motivate more people to go to the electronic record, I, I don't know. I don't have an answer for that. I, it drives me crazy. I think they should have made the move years ago. Just for one more. Uh, can you comment on non-users, uh, government, IT specialists, non-EMR doc doctors? involvement in shaping EMR products in good or bad ways? Oh, uh, examples of uh, physicians or non-physicians shaping products incorrectly, is that what you're saying? The, like the software architects? There's involvement in shaping it in either good or bad ways. Yeah. Uh, you know what, that's never going to go away. Uh, there are, most of the programmers out there writing software for physicians are not physicians themselves. There's nothing wrong with that. But there needs to be physician involvement in designing the system so that the physician, or, or I'm sorry, so that the system becomes clinically relevant. Any, any software that's written by a programmer is written for a programmer's understanding of medicine. It's not written for a physician's understanding of medicine. The walk a mile in my moccasins type of attitude is probably the only way that the software can become relevant. So it has to have physician input and be driven by physicians. But having said that, don't ever limit yourself to software written by a physician. Physician's way of thinking is incompatible with appropriate programming. Uh, the worst programs in the world are written by physicians who think they can program. Because a physician thinks in quantum leaps of logic. A computer does sequential logic. And the doctor cannot understand that. And they just, you know, if I hit this, I want that to happen. And it doesn't happen that way. So software written by doctors has a tendency to be unintelligible. Uh, just one other thing I'll make as a comment. Uh, one thing you'll be glad to hear is I understand it, that uh, the uh, Ontario MD has written and uh, signed now a memorandum of understanding 
with Smart Systems for Health Agency, where SSHA will take on the development of, uh, continued development of what they're doing. So it'll bring, I think, a degree of order to what, unfortunately, an unfortunate past. Yeah. Bill, thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me.